today. I want to give God all the glory and all the honor for a wonderful, blessed week. Um, how many of you ever done any painting projects at your house? I mean, like painting walls and furniture. Lord Jesus, I am going to pray for a new body because seriously, the last time I painted was maybe 15 years ago. Boy, I felt muscles I didn't know I had. But I, I appreciate the, the helpers that I had at my house. They were very humble and helped me all through this week. Would you believe we put in practically 30 hours? Well, I know I did some after work, but I put 32 hours of painting. Needless to say, <laughs> I know, I, I'm, just, I'm just like that. And I enjoy painting projects because I re reap the benefits. How much more is that when you put work into the, to your journey and the mission that's a call upon your life you reap the benefits once you've done it. Do you know what I'm saying with that? You put in the work, but you reap the benefits. You know, um, do the work that Christ has called you to do. And if you don't know, pray about it. If you want some um, advice or counseling, seek Pastor Robert, seek my dad, some other brothers and sisters of the church family here in Dunamis Life Church. In that continuation, for, uh, we just want to um, thank God for the, the team. The Spanish team had their first service here on Friday night. Amen. Yes. So if you are interested in inviting someone for a Spanish, total Spanish inclusive service on a Friday night, invite someone. They start sharply at 730 Although the young, you know, if they have children or young adults, really more young adults, there's a youth program taking place as well, and as well as tribe. But more than anything, I want to talk to you about the Spanish service. Um, seek Brother Carlos Lechuga, Salvador Villanueva, which is my dad, Pastor Salvador Villanueva, Araceli, Silvia, they're here. You know, um, seek them out. If you know of some family members that you're like, I want to invite them to a church service, Friday night. Friday night, it's all Spanish. So I, I thank God for the glory and honor for that, to allowing our doors to be open for the community to come and serve. As well as that, um, Sister Ana Castillo, if you don't know who she is, she's probably around here somewhere. So Sister Ana Castillo is our, lead, our women's leader. So we do have a, a social gathering. So for those who are in the Spanish service, please let your Spanish families know that we have a social time this Wednesday with Ana Castillo El Meson. That's in Spanish. I don't know how to say it in English. El Mezo. Good try, right, right, right? All right. So we do have a gathering here um, on this Wednesday. So if you need more information, there's, you can take a picture of the plaque that's on the wall on your way out to your right or see Sister I. And we can socialize and we can have a time of fellowship among the women. Oh, yeah, I should have said that, right? It was just for women. I didn't say that just for women. We need some time together. All right, here we go. So to continue with the blessings we have been bestowed upon our lives, we have four ways here is text to give 773-985-5060, online www.dlifechurch.org backslash give, so backslash quick pay, dlifechurch at yahoo.com, and cash app money symbol dlifechurch. And I, I, I thank God blessings of time and talent that he has given to me, my family and my church family. So let's stand up and, and, and who are going to give their tithing and offerings today, which you could do in the house if you have it monetarily and on hand. You could give it to the ushers on the way out, and you have your kiosk in the back. Let's stand to Lord Jesus, we give you all the glory and all the honor. Lord, I thank you for multiplication of finances that you bless homes and they're able to make their payments to take care of those to take care of the home but as they bring it into this church home Lord father the storehouse they, they you may multiply it every which way and then we continue to have the and the programs created Lord father and continue to minister to family to know Lord, to know your love that you are their Jehovah Jireh Jehovah Tuskunui Jehovah Rapha thank you Lord Jesus and to bestow house. In Jesus' name we pray and we say Amen. Amen. Amen.
God, all the glory and the honor to on this morning. Before we go any further, that we do want to make mention of our sister in Christ. For those of you who may or may not know her, we want to honor in today, today our sister Arlene. You know her story. It's a blessing to have her today with us. Please. Please give a round of applause and honor for what God is still doing in our people. So we want to honor you, Sister Darlene. Welcome. Welcome. If you see her, please, please give her a, a, a encouraging word. Amen. Come on, we come to worship the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. together. You came to set the captives free. You came to bring us liberty. My sin and my rejection met your blood and my acceptance. Now I'm alive to bring you praise. Hey, the spirit of the Lord, there is freedom. When the spirit of the Lord, there is freedom. Every chain is My fool. 
I'm not going to preach. We got a special speaker, Prophet Dr. Luke Holter. And so we want to let him just let it loose. So I want you to just give it up for the Lord right now. Just give him a praise offering. We welcome all those that are on Facebook and YouTube. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You guys can be seated. If you don't know Prophet Dr. Luke Holter, then you're in for a huge treat of what God is going to do. It's going to be powerful. Got to line this up right in the middle here. And as we talked about two weeks ago, about honor, we need to honor the prophetic gifting that's in his life. He is a powerful prophet. And as we learned, the word of God says, you honor a prophet, you shall receive a prophet's reward. And today we honor Dr. Luke Coulter. He could be anywhere in this country, but he's here with us at Dunamis Life Church. 
And so we're excited of what God is going to do. So be ready, be open, hear from the Lord as God speaks through him. And um, we're just going to hand it right over to him. And, and we want to give him all the time to share and do what he does. And so today, I want you to put your hands together for Prophet Dr. Luke Holter. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, worship team. Awesome. Come on now. Let me hear y'all out there. Thank God for worship. I could not do what I do without worship. You know, I travel all over the world and I meet some, uh, some guys that speak at churches and um, they want to sit in the green room and not be disturbed. But I want to be amongst the people worshiping God together. I need, I need his presence to do what he's called me to do, as we all do. We all need his presence. You need, we need his presence to balance our checkbook. Amen? So, some younger generation doesn't know what that means. We, we need his presence to love our neighbor. Amen? We need his presence to do whatever he's called us to do. We can't do it by ourselves. Any of y'all ever try to white knuckle it? Try to get through it? Try to force yourself to do it without his presence? It always ends up worse off. And so he's got a better plan. I'm excited for this morning. Is there a way, Pastor, that we could bring the house lights up so I could see how beautiful all these people are? It helps me if I can see your faces. Let's get some, we're going to get some lights moving here. I'd like to thank you all for having me in this morning. I'm very excited to be here. God is moving across the nation. I'm seeing it everywhere we go. People healed, delivered. People stepping up and prophesying and evangelizing the lost. We're seeing countless numbers come to know Christ. And I'm so excited about what God's doing. I'm, I come to you, for those of you who don't know me, which is a lot of you, since the last time I was here, you've kind of had a, uh, a new, new blood come in. And so some of you are like, who's this tattooed white boy that they brought in today? Well, I'm from Houston, Texas. So I'm bringing you love from the third coast Amen? The birthplace of Dirty South Hip Hop. I'm on loan to you this morning from my amazing, beautiful Filipino wife and my amazing, beautiful half Norwegian, half Filipino daughter. They've loaned me out to you this weekend. Amen? Pastor, um, I'm so honored to get to be here with y'all and to be with Dunamis. Um, God has a special plan this morning, and not just this morning. But God has a special agenda for the people in this room. <clears throat> One of the ways the enemy loves to drag the church down is to convince it that it's not what it's called to be. But one of the most major things that's ever happened throughout all time happened in Bethlehem in a tiny manger. Manger ministries are moving into major ministries. Places of small beginnings. People may look and go, well... They looked like they looked at David and said, he's just a boy. What can he do against a giant? Now, listen, I'm from the South. I'm going to need to hear y'all Yankees a little bit better. I'm just telling y'all. I, I need to hear some voices up in here. I, I appreciate the energy in this Catholic church this morning. Come on now. I'm excited about what God's doing. God is breaking boundaries and he's having the bride come out of the box and that's where we're inviting you to go this morning is out of the box. God is doing some crazy things. And it's not just with pulpit ministry. It's not just pastor. It's not just people that are on the platform. But God's anointing the everyday believer to step into new realms of creativity, new realms of business, of entrepreneurial spirits being released, of favor being released. We can only be so many places at one time. But the grassroots movement of a church can radically affect the city they're in. But you've got to realize there's no difference between you and me. None. Some of y'all may look at me and go, well, that's a man of God. I can't do what he does. Look, he, God saved a savage when he picked me. I've got no accolades of my own. I've got nothing to be proud of in my own sense of things. It's only through Christ that I've been made good. It's only through Christ that we've experienced the things we've experienced. 
and you have that same access. For those of you who don't know me, um, when Jesus found me, I was 25 years old. I'm 45 now, so it's been a minute. But when Jesus found me, I was living with a lesbian, dating a stripper witch, and working for a drug dealer for seven years. I was dying of a drug overdose. I had a heart attack when I was 25 from ODing and uh, went into the emergency room. I was on a date with um, uh, my girlfriend that was a witch and a stripper and um, OD'd. And she took me to the hospital and um, had to go through a six and a half hour heart surgery and was slated to die that day. But God's gracious hand held back death. Amen? Amen. God doesn't call people that are qualified. That's right. He qualifies the called. So my encouragement to you this morning is, if you got baggage, if you got stuff, if you got issues, so what? Who cares? Push delete and get over it. Like just get up and the, the real you is not the worst version of you. It's the best version of you. People have got to get past shame-based Christianity and move into the economy of grace so that you'll get up and become active and step out and not feel like shame is holding you back. Can I just tell y'all, if you don't have what it takes, it makes you prime real estate. The fact that you can't take the glory makes you prime real estate for God to use you. Amen? Man, in just the last two and a half years, we've led over 6,000 Muslims to Christianity under our ministry. In the last few years, in the last five years, we've experienced over 80,000 first-time salvations under our ministry. We have two orphanages in Colombia where we rescue sex trafficked kids from the age of 5 to 17. And we're building, breaking ground on our third orphanage in Colombia. That's, that's God. That's not me. I'm... <laughs> I was diagnosed ADHD in the third grade and put on Ritalin and told by the school system I was handicapped. They said, you'll never do math, you'll never do English well. The world put labels on me. The world came in and said, you are defective. And God said, I call you perfected. Amen. God chose me, just like he chose you. One of the most difficult things we're in right now for the body of Christ is getting people to actually buy into their calling, to agree that they're called, to look past insufficiencies, to look past issues and go, you know what, I, I am dark yet lovely. For those of you that don't know, that's in the Bible. It's not a racial thing. Although if you are dark, you are lovely. Amen? Amen? All right. <laughs> I'm going to pray and then we're going to get it on like Donkey Kong. How does that sound? Good? All right, bow your heads and close your eyes so Jesus can hear you. <laughs> Lord, help. <clears throat> God, I thank you for this room of uniquely amazing, beautiful people. Father, it is a privilege and not a right. It's a privilege to get to speak in front of royalty. Father, I pray that unhealthy ideas would be surrendered at the foot of the cross today. Father, that all across this room, we would submit to your kingship, Jesus. That we would submit any wrong theology, any from the past, from Christians, for release judgment from our own hands and put it into yours. Father, that any wrong ideas we may have submitted to our minds this morning. Father, we break the power of fear. Lord, we bind the work of anxiety. Father, I thank you that today, even though I will prophesy, I did not come as a prophet. I came as a physician. Lord, my prayer is that hearts would be open that's about to In your name we pray. Amen. Christ called me. That's where he spared my life. The thing that, you know, really encouraged me, the Lord gave me. He said, you can stay or you can die. Death was a real option. I was depressed. I was drug addicted. I had broken every relationship I had ever had. Stolen from family to supply my drug habit. I said you could stay. I saw that Jesus showed me. One, 
Jackson woman in a Michael Jackson wedding. <laughs> That's weird, right? <clears throat> the second of a baby girl in it, so I knew if I lived, I would have a wife who loved me, and I would have a daughter. And seeing into the future and seeing that picture inspired me to want to live, inspired me to want to make it, and so life that day. Seven years later, across a crowded room in Houston, Texas, I moved from the city to Houston, Texas. I was like, hey, all the single ladies, all the single ladies. All right. <clears throat> Doesn't mean it's a good place to meet single people. Sometimes Christians aren't safe either. Y'all need discernment, okay? <laughs> we need discernment. <laughs> and so I'm in church, and I look across the room, and it's the Asian girl from my vision. Not an Asian girl that looks like the Asian girl. It's the Asian girl from my vision. She turns around, and she's wearing a Michael Jackson Beat It t-shirt. We call that a context clue. <laughs> that was the Michael Jackson wedding dress. I was like, whoa, like this is the one. Right? I didn't walk up to her, though, and say, hey, when I was dying of a drug overdose and dating a stripper witch and living with a lesbian, the Lord said that you would be my wife. That's not a good pickup line. Hi. So, what do you do? And she's like, oh, I just graduated college, and um, I have degrees in mathematics and computer science, and I work for NASA. <laughs> and I was like, that's cool. She's like, what do you do? And I was like, I'm between careers. <laughs> right? I'm diversifying my assets. I was unemployed, <laughs> is what I was. I had just moved there. And I got a job at Jack in the Box. Because I'm about that work life. I don't care. I will work. I've, I've worked as long. It was since I was 12 years old. If I could work, I worked. And I was like, I'm going to marry this girl, and I'm going to pay for a wedding with burger money. <laughs> and I did. And paid for our wedding, or engagement ring, all that was burger flipping money. Fried clothes. Jack in, the Jack in the box up here? Yeah. Not anymore. It went out. God bless y'all. We'll be, we'll be interceding. <laughs> it was, Yeah. But that's where I worked, and, and uh, we got married, and for four years we tried to have kids, and they said, you'll never have children. Went to fertility clinic. They told my wife she'd never conceive. They told me, they said, you'll never be able to get a woman pregnant. We were perfectly matched in the ability to not produce life. But I had a vision when I was 25, dying of a drug overdose, of a baby girl in a birthing unit. Now, I saw my wife, and I found her in real life. It wasn't just a vision that was my imagination. It was the Holy Spirit. So if I found my wife and that was true, that meant it was also true that somewhere in our DNA was a little girl that needed to be born. So the fertility clinic said it'll never happen. We went home, and we cried. We laid in bed and cried that night, and um, we allowed disappointment to determine what we believed about God. Be careful with that. Don't allow your disappointment to baptize your eyes. God is bigger than your disappointment. If you have disappointment, it's either two options. Either you brought it on yourself, or it's an opportunity for God to show his glory, or both, really. Even if you brought it on yourself, if you humble yourself, he'll break in. He's a good dad. So we're laying there in bed, and I got mad. I did what some of y'all need to do. Instead of being filled with anxiety and worry and frustration, I got mad because I'm owed a daughter. God told me, and he's not a liar. He's not like man that he would lie. God showed me a daughter. So I did what some of y'all need to do. You need to get mad about your promises. It's the enemy delaying it. Why make a peace treaty with it? Why go, oh, well, I just figure that's the way it'll always be. So I stood up in my bed angry. And my wife's like, what are you doing? And I said, you know what? I'm going to get you pregnant. <laughs> Faith without works is dead. So I received the Teddy Pendergrass anointing. Light a candle. Nine months later. 
My daughter came screaming into this world. Everything good in my life came from prophecy. Came from prophecy being released to give me hope, to remind me of what's to come. Can I just tell you all that sometimes you got to remind yourself to be thankful? Well, I'm going to give you a weapon today. I did come to you as a surgeon, and we're going to do some heart surgery. I came to do a few things. I came as a surgeon. I came as the head of the guard to weaponize you, and hopefully as a mortician to help you bury some things that need to be dead. Amen? We're going after it this morning. I believe that Christians should have the most powerful lives. We should, but we don't. We've sold off power for opinion. You know, there's a difference between power and authority. How many of you know that when a police officer stands in front of your car and tells you to stop, he's not strong enough to stop your 2,000-pound vehicle? He doesn't have the power to stop your car. But what does he have? the authority to stop the car. As believers, we've got to get into this place where we understand the authority and power that's been given to us through Christ Jesus, that we would not be tossed around or haunted by the enemy, but that we would stand up and fight. We've made too many exceptions for the enemy because of superstition. Oh, if I get blessed, how many of you have heard this? You get blessed at work. Maybe you get a promotion. Maybe you get a raise. Maybe you get a bonus. Something happens and people go, oh, you better watch out now. The devil's really after you now. That's not in the Bible. New levels, new devils, not in the Bible. We need to stop equating the power of the enemy with God's blessings. We get blessed and we think, oh, now we're really going to be under attack. The good news is this. The devil always wants to kill you. That's your encouraging word this morning. (laughs) That never changes. But he doesn't become more powerful when God blesses you. Some of you are scared to reach your destiny because of what it might cost you. But I want to tell you, the exchange rate with God is always worth it. You will pay a price to get where God wants you to be. But the price is your flesh. The prize is him. I promise you it's worth it. What God has for your destiny is far greater than lesser pleasures that the enemy might offer. But we need to live powerful, authoritative lives. We need to have power in our lives, but we don't. A lot of Christians don't live in power. That way, we we are not heaven for other people. We need to be heaven. Stop looking for portals in your city. Stop looking for open heavens in your city. You are the portal, and you are the open heaven. You are how heaven invades earth. You're it. There's no plan B. You're it. (laughs) For those of you in the room that are like, but I know me, so does he. And he still picked you. Every day I wake up, and this is not preacher talk. Every day I wake up and look in the mirror and I'm like, why did you pick me? I'm awful at so many things. God, why did you pick me to do this? And he's like, I am sufficient for you. He said, Luke, because you're the donkey that's willing to let me ride in on. He's looking for donkeys to ride in on. And thank God there's a lot of donkeys in this room. (laughs) Some of y'all got that. Well, God wants to break fear, anxiety, and worry off your life because it's a cancer. It's It's the real disease. It spreads to everything you love. And never in history, I should say recent history, have we had this kind of pressure, stress, and anxiety related to viruses, related to economic unrest, related to racial unrest. All these things going on in our nation have become idols that we are more than happy to worship. We have to stop worshiping idols of fear and start believing again in the God that tips idols over, in the God that overcomes idols. You will never fix a racial issue in this country through politics. It's only through a baptism of the Holy Spirit, people giving their lives over to Christ and being transformed that we can create new culture, that we can bind things like racism. 
We live in a fallen world. You'll never make somebody understand your racial pain by exposing them to the same pain. People don't learn through pain. It jades us. It harms us. Unless Christ is involved in it, he refines us in it. Fear is a weird animal, isn't it? Fear doesn't fight fair. My dad, this is the first thing I learned about fear. Fear is unreasonable. My dad, I grew up in North Dakota, 20 minutes from Canada. We had one lake there, Lake Sakakawea, the big, big lake, right? One of the largest lakes in that whole area. But we have no predator fish. We've got walleye and, you know, northern pikes, nothing dangerous, sturgeon. But my dad was convinced because in the 70s, he watched the movie Jaws. <clears throat> My dad was convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that somewhere in some lake there was a sleeping shark that was going to wake up and want to eat my dad. He would never go into the water like that. Even in pools, and don't play hard with me this morning. You all know you're the same way about some things. You ever in a pool by yourself and get freaked out? You swim to the edge faster? <laughs> like You psych yourself out because your imagination starts taking over? You want to know how to make fear stronger? Your imagination. But my dad was deathly afraid of shark attacks. Like there was some shark out there that was so hungry for Barry Holter. Like sh sharks were out there under the ocean talking, just like, have you heard about this guy? I heard he's delicious. <laughs> and my parents, they moved to Houston now, where we have sharks in Galveston. And my dad's like, I oh, will never go in there. But you know what caused him to go into the, into the gulf? Where there's bull sharks and all those aggressive sharks that can come up? A granddaughter. The granddaughter that wanted to go and play and splash a little bit. My dad faced his fear because love beckoned him in. It's unreasonable fear. Think about it. How many times have you been at work? <laughs> And your boss comes by your desk or maybe emails you or calls you and is like, hey, I need to talk to you. Or maybe it's your spouse. It's like, we need to have a conversation. <laughs> right? Immediately, you're like a nervous chihuahua. <laughs> right? Look, I grew up with IBS, y'all. I'm just saying, like, whenever I got in trouble, I was like, oh, okay, I got to use the bathroom. Like, I was scared out of my mind instantly. Right? <laughs> Some of y'all are a little more classy than I am, but when fear presents itself, but there's no explanation to what it is, our imagination takes over and it begins to worship fear. People say, I need to speak with you. And instantly your stomach's all messed up. You're nervous. You start getting clammy and sweaty. You're preparing for a mental fight. Now, I don't know what traffic is like so much in Chicago, but in Houston, People will kill someone <laughs> to get into the next lane. Hello? Now, I have been in your traffic a little bit. I know y'all know a lot of sign language. <laughs> <laughs> but we fantasize all the time about conflict and fights when that person's rude to you at the grocery store. Right? The checkout clerk, right? They're giving you attitude, but you don't say anything. Then you get out to your car and you're driving home and you're like, oh yeah, well your mama's fat. And besides, like you start going through imaginary arguments in your mind where you're a only one. I doubt it. I know people. People love to daydream about conflict. Don't believe me? Just go to Facebook. Just go to social media. Do you want to see what a fight looks like? Just type something not even controversial. I Facebook. Jesus loves you. And I will have Christians on there being like, no, he doesn't. Y'all are going to hell because you got tattoos. And I'm like, look, I wasn't born saved. I got here as quick as I could. Like, Good Lord. <laughs> there's a meme that's going around. I don't know if y'all have seen it, but where it's Jesus and there's a crowd and they ask him a question. They say, can you go to heaven if you have tattoos? 
And Jesus says, yes, even if you ask stupid questions. <laughs> well, food for thought. I'm going to give you the definition because <clears throat> worry is one of the things that God wants to pull out. It's robbing you. It's robbing you of freedom, you of power, robbing you of break. Nature is we worship what we fear. And because image bearers, we cast back the image of the thing we're worshiping. No matter what it is. That's how God created us. So we wind up empowering fear instead of empowering God. This is the definition of worry by the dictionary. Y'all ready? Tell me if this sounds familiar to any of y'all this morning, all right? Don't worry, we'll get out of here on time, okay? We'll still beat the Baptist to the buffet, okay? <laughs> this is the definition of worry. <clears throat> to torment oneself with disturbing thoughts. That's not familiar to anybody in the room. You get a pain in your hip and you get a MD. Thing you search on Google is dying, just so you know. It helps somebody out in the room. You're like, I got a pain. It's like, oh, you've got bone cancer. You're like, cancer. I have a headache. Oh, you're about to die from an aneurysm. I'm going to have an aneurysm. We wind up, <laughs> we won't go to a real doctor, but we'll waste hours of our time on the internet reading about all the potential things that are happening to us. We wind up daydreaming and we let things become more powerful than they should be. They rob us of our time, of our joy, of our hope. And it brings depression onto us. I have never seen a time or a generation more full of anxiety than right now. And God came to comfort. The Holy Spirit's called the comforter. What we need is the Holy Spirit to give your problems away. All those anxieties, all those stresses. I don't know how I'm going to get through college. I don't know how I'm going to get through my job. I don't know how I'm going to get through this marriage. I don't know how I'm going to get through these kids. Find comforter that will you and help you along if you submit to him. That's a curse word in the church sometimes. Submission. It's there for a reason. Amen? It causes us to worry. Why are we nervous people? Why do we have worry and anxiety? Because of unresolved disappointment. There's places in life where you've been dropped by people and situations where you've been wounded and you've been hurt and you have not allowed the Holy Spirit to heal the root of that pain. So it becomes your new filter on how you read the Bible and how you do relationship. That's why some of us date the same hot messes. Because, listen, the first girl I ever loved in my life that I gave my gift away to that I was supposed to save for my wife, that girl that I thought I was going to marry, broke my heart and my life. I was tormented by that relationship for an entire decade of not being enough for someone else. And I chased the ghost of her and every girl I dated after her looking for a version of her to heal me. The person that hurt you can't heal you. The situation that broke you will never be your medicine. The Holy Spirit has to heal you. The Holy Spirit has to do a work in your heart to make you whole again. But we've got unresolved disappointment. And because of unresolved disappointment, we become skeptical believers skeptical people. This is how worry works. Listen, it starts in one area and it spreads to your faith. Because if God let you get hurt the first time, what's to stop him from letting you getting hurt again? What you believe about God really does matter, you know. What if we came to a place in the body of Christ where we understood that God wasn't punishing us? There are things called consequences. I have consequences to leading a drug-addicted life and a life that I led before. There's medical consequences that I face to this day that I intercede and pray for healing in that I believe God will heal me of. But those are consequences. That's not God's punishment. The problem is we think God's punished us when we face consequences and it builds up more calluses on our hearts and we go, I went through this hard time. God must have been punishing me for something. 
He's a good father. He's not trying to trick you. You can trust him. He's more trustworthy than you are. The problem is we get into this place where we look at God and we're like, well, I've been hurt. And he's like, okay, let's talk about how you got hurt, why you got hurt. Well, I was doing something in a relationship I shouldn't have been doing. And he's like, I love you, but there you go. That's, you rented out your heart. There's, there's situations we find ourselves in that we get wounded in and then we turn. I don't understand why we turn on God. When pain comes into our lives, why we take it out on Jesus. When people hurt us in church and we take it out on Jesus. It's stupid. Somebody hurt you, people are like, well, I don't like to go to church. Bunch of hypocrites. You're a hypocrite. <laughs> what do you know? Because you're hurt? You think you can judge the entire church? That's hypocritical. So you got hurt in church. Welcome to the family, baby. Like... <laughs> That just, it comes with the turf. <laughs> got Christians up in here thinking they're persecuted when they're just inconvenienced. I meet Christians all the time that are like, that waitress was rude to me, but I will survive this persecution for his glory. <laughs> God's like, no, nah, you had the attitude. You were just inconvenienced. Try complaining about this to a, a pastor in China that's missing his hand for preaching the gospel. We've got disappointment. Why is disappointment so important? Look, we ain't going that deep this morning. I hope y'all are with me. Why is disappointment so dangerous? Because it affects your faith. Your faith, you want to know how God moves through you miraculously? It's not through winning the lottery. People think that they win this spiritual lottery and revival will break out. Or maybe if I pray just right, somebody will get healed. It's not a lottery. It's your faith. And the word of God tells us that it's our faith that God moves through to change circumstances. So baby, you don't have time to have a decrease in your faith. If you're hurting, that's the time you need to increase your faith. You need to speak to things that are not as if they are. <clears throat> I'm preaching better than you're helping me this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Worry is the enemy of faith. Worry is the worship of the devil. You're allowing the enemy to steal God's worship when you worry. The enemy comes to you with worry, with fear, and tries to steal God's glory and tries to steal God's stability in your life. What would happen if you stopped worrying and you just thought, I'll do the right thing and God will work it out. Whenever I get hit in my finances, you know what I do? I don't sit there and go, I don't know how I'm going to make it next month. We got to raise 30 grand a month just for the orphanage. That's not our ministry. That's not even our entire ministry budget a month. We got to raise 30K a month. It's a thousand bucks to buy each kid from a pimp. And then we provide medicine, education, adoption. But there's times it gets real lean, real tight. So I start selling stuff. <laughs> I have my shoes, exactly. I'm a sneakerhead. And I customize sneakers, so people will hire me to customize their sneakers for them, and I'll paint them. I got Angela's Paint Supply, all that stuff. I'll do that to raise money for the orphans. I'll sell sneakers that I have to raise money for the orphans. We'll do whatever it takes. The one thing we're not going to do is glorify the devil by giving in to worry and saying, well, I guess we have to give up. We help 15 single mothers in Houston where we pay all their rent, all their medical care, all their insurance on their vehicles, their price for their monthly payments for their vehicles. We pay everything so they don't have to pay a penny. And then we help send them to college. These are single moms that are victims of human trafficking in Houston. We help every single one of them. And when things get tight, I'm not bragging. That's not a brag. When things get tight, we get told by other Christians, well, you're going to have to stop doing that. I will sell everything I own to make sure that those kids and those moms are taken care of. When I made that assignment with the Lord and I said, I'll do it, he knew what was coming. He knew the promises. And every time he delivers, every single time he comes through. Your 11th hour is not his 11th hour. Some of y'all are freaking out and God's like, just hang tight, baby. Be faithful. Have some faith. Decree something. 
We talk trash all the time without thinking twice. What if we decreed something? What if, what if we started releasing a life out of our mouth? What if we believed when the word said that we have the power of life and death in our tongue? That means as a believer, you have just as much power when you bless something as you do when you curse something. Which means you got to watch your mouth too. Watch what you're in agreement with. I've been in churches where somebody has looked at the pastor's wife and said, she's got a Jezebel spirit. She didn't, but you just released one to work against her that she now has to contend against. Watch your mouth. People would say things like, oh, you're a pastor's kid, huh? Oh, you're going to lead a shady life. You're going to do bad things. I was in the sixth grade when they were telling, I'm just trying to watch Ninja Turtles. Like, and I had people in the church telling me I was going to be a bad boy. Seven years in drug addiction. Seven years working for a drug dealer. Four of those years in debt collection for him. I was definitely evil. But I'm wondering how much of that was a road paved through the words of believers. Watch your mouth. Speak positive. Speak power. Speak life. You know what song I play for my daughter every day when she gets ready for school? My daughter was born perfect. I love my daughter. She's my whole world. Her name is Gemma Love. And she's half Filipino and half me. And I'm just telling y'all, mixed babies are on point. Okay? <laughs> I feel like I'm a dad to every, every kid I see. That's just God created me to be 90% teddy bear. Like, I'll be out at the mall and I'm like, hi. <laughs> My wife has to remind me, because I was raised by hippies. My wife has to remind me, like, don't do that when you're alone. Because <laughs> it looks a little shady. <laughs> Tattooed <laughs> guy in a tank top in the mall being like I love kids I was made to be a dad that's just my DNA but my daughter was branded from a kid from a young age already ADHD and she has dyslexia now we could worry about her entire future or we can speak things over her and not agree with the worry and the fear well she won't be successful why not? I was diagnosed ADHD, learning disabled in math and English. I'm a Barnes & Noble record-breaking author. Like, that's God's DNA. God has a plan for it. <clears throat> Worry is the enemy of power. I'm going to give you some Bible. How many of you would like some word this morning? Serve it up hot and fresh. <laughs> Every morning when my daughter gets ready, this is what I do. This is the power of positivity. We play worship music, right? We do all that, but we got a jam that we play every morning before school by a group called Nappy Roots. It's called Good Day. That's the song, and that's the chorus. Because we're going to have a good day, and all my homies going to ride today, and ain't nobody going to die today. It's a great song about being positive. That matters. Some of you are like, he just sang a secular song. <clears throat> That's okay, you listen to it in the car, so who cares? <laughs> I had a guy come up to me that was like, he's a brother in Christ, and he's like, he's somebody I mentor, and he's like, he's an older guy. And he's like, I'm trying to get out of the box, and he's like, but I just can't get past your tattoos. I just feel like it's really a hindrance. <clears throat> and he's like, and I just, I can't support your ministry, you know, with the way you look. And I went, okay, um, I counseled you for six months on your porn addiction. Interesting. We got people living lives judging other people. You know why we like to do that? Because it makes us feel more distance from our brokenness. If I can lump you in a group, then it makes us Just some food for thought. I'm trying to help somebody out this morning. <clears throat> you need faith. In fear will kill your faith if you get me. If you entertain it, if you live in a fantasy world full of fear or full of power. Now listen, you can be powerful in your fantasy, but never be powerful in real life. That's why you have those imaginary fights in traffic with somebody. That's why you have those arguments of what you should have said. <clears throat> I'm a prophet, I can hear it. I see, you know, I was at the mall. <clears throat> I had parked my car and I started walking up. By the way, can I just say this? I love the weather right now here in Chicago. 
all, all day long. When I left Houston, it was 109 with the heat index. This right here, I'm like, it's a spring day. <clears throat> Lord, help me. We'll move on. I'm going to give you some word. I promise you some word, so let's dig in. Matthew 20, 18 through 22. Paraphrase some of this and well. <clears throat> it's a story where Jesus curses a fig tree. How many of you know that story in the Bible? It's a pretty popular story, right? Jesus and the disciples are rolling by, and they see this fig tree. <clears throat> Jesus is hungry, and he goes up to this fig tree, and he wants some figs. And he gets up to it, and it's not producing fruit. There's no fruit on the fig tree. Now, scholars and historians will tell you that during this season of time, when Jesus and the disciples were going through this area, figs would not have been in season. There shouldn't have been any fruit on that tree in the natural. So why did Jesus get mad? It's because when he approached, it should have bared fruit. Whenever he draws near, you should bear fruit. The earth wasn't responding to his kingship. That's why he cursed the tree. It was a sign of so Jesus impresses the disciples. They see this fig tree. It says, in the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. And by the wayside, and found nothing on it, but only. And he said to it, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once, which in the Greek means withered at once. Okay. <clears throat> when the disciples saw it, they saying, how did the fig tree wither at once? There. Can I just say, disciples? Like, how many miracles did Jesus perform and these disciples were constantly like, how did you do that? Jesus is like, uh, God, we talked about this. Like, my DNA is his DNA. You guys don't get this. It's funny to me that we idolize the disciples and we're like, man, if I could be Apostle Paul, just be like, not like Peter, but, you know, <laughs> some of us live like Peter. But, where we're like, if I could just be like one of the disciples, John. Look, most, <laughs> most of what the disciples did, they weren't filled with the Holy Spirit. They couldn't be saved. Jesus died. So most of these miraculous things they participated in, they participated in miracles, signs, and wonders, yet filled with the Holy Spirit. How did they do that? Because they were in the company of Jesus. And there's power in his name. And just him being there brought miracles. Jesus anointed them with his presence until they could have an upper room experience. Do you see the math of that? You have to get intimate before you can have the experience. You have to spend time with him. Sometimes walking through a desert. Sometimes going through a dry season. Sometimes going through the wilderness before you get the upper room experience. But we wind up quitting halfway because of worry and anxiety and a lack of faith. But be encouraged because he carries the miraculous. They marveled saying, how did this fig tree wither at once? <clears throat> Verse 21, it says, and Jesus answered them, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt you will not only do what's been done to this fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Faith is a prerequisite for the miraculous. God can't break into your life without your faith. Stop relying on his sovereignty and start relying on your faith. We wind up living on the fumes of an experience we had a year ago with him when he showed up. And we wind up being on autopilot. But I'm telling you, the encounter you had that was so monumental in your brain that you remember, you can live every single day if you have faith. We've had three documented on film resurrections that we've prayed for dead people. That wasn't because I've been marked by God to raise the dead. It's because I believed that God wanted that it wasn't their time. We, we were baptizing 300 people in water. And one of the guys died in the pool of an aneurysm. His wife's a nurse. We got him out of the pool. He was dead, dead. I'm not talking about Princess Bride mostly dead. He was dead, dead. Where he evacuated his bowels, dead. His wife, who's a nurse, said he was dead. For 15 minutes while we were waiting for an ambulance to show up. And nobody was praying for this guy to live. 
And the Lord's like, are, are you going to pray? And I was like, oh, oh, I don't know. Like, I was thinking, like, I'm the least qualified in this room of these bishops to pray for this dude. And the Lord's like, just go over there and tell him to knock it off. <laughs> I was like, knock it off? Because in your mind, it's like Lord of the Rings, right? Like, you think it's got to be this big, like, drawn out, like, by the power of Jesus Christ. <laughs> The third day resurrected son of the most high God. Like, you imagine this overdramatic, right? By the power of Grayskull. Like, you, you, you imagine all these magical words. And Jesus isn't in those words. He's in the heart. So I just walk over to the guy and I go, enough. And he sits up in front of everybody, in front of 300 people. He goes, <gasps> sits up. And I was like, nobody touch him. Right? I'm like, don't talk, because look, I'm a natural skeptic, which is hilarious that God would make me a prophet. Because I'm the dude looking for wires. I'm the dude that's like, I don't believe that. And I'm like looking under chairs, and God's like, guess what? You're a prophet. I'm like, oh, good. I get to make up with all the weirdos. And so I'm like, nobody talk to him. Nobody touch him. Nobody say a word. And we took him into this uh, the gym, the locker room there, so he could shower. They had a change of clothes because this whole organization was just for baptizing. So they had shorts and clean clothes for him. We got him changed, and I said, okay, what, from your perspective, happened? He's like, well, I felt like a knife was shoved into my brain. He goes, and then I lost all consciousness, and he's like, it was just black. He goes, then I could see my body. And he goes, and I watched you get up out of the pool and walk over and say, enough. He goes, and then, shoo, right back into my body. Nobody had told him anything. I made sure of it, that nobody put any ideas in his head. And he had experienced it. And it was because of faith. It wasn't because I was the most anointed man in the room. It was simply because of faith that I stepped up and said, no, it's not his time. I heard the Holy Spirit say, hey, go pray for him, which means it's not his time to die. Now, I've prayed for others that have, dead, that have been dead and nothing happened. First time I ever prayed for somebody was I was preaching in Pasadena, Texas, and at this little small Hispanic church that meets in a funeral home between, between services. So they're like, they bring me in. I didn't know all this. So I pull up to a funeral home to preach a message. And I get in there. And there's a grandma behind me in a casket. <clears throat> They're like, it's her funeral next, so just you've got about 25 minutes to preach. And I'm like, okay. So like, I have an interpreter there. We're getting through it. Everybody leaves. It was a great service. Everyone leaves. I'm left alone with grandma. So I turn around, look at grandma in the casket, and I'm like, Live. making sure no one's in the room to judge me. Live in the name of Jesus. Right? I jump back a little bit. I'm like, what's Half of y'all wouldn't know what to do if that happened. Some of y'all watch The Walking Dead too much. You'd wind up re-killing grandma. Like, she's a zombie. Like, you just... Faith is not complicated. You know what faith is? Faith is believing that God told you the truth. That's it. It's believing that what his word says is true. Amen? Now, when I was getting married, we were engaged and we were getting ready to get married. <clears throat> I realized my wife and I had opposite lives, right? I dated a stripper witch and lived with a lesbian and worked for a drug dealer. <laughs> she was super faithful, went to college and stayed faithful to the Lord and waited for marriage. Total polar opposites. I almost didn't marry my wife because I felt not qualified. I felt like I've got this dirty past. I'm broken. I'm damaged goods. She should really have a husband that waited for her. That was my mentality. God had other plans. But we get married. <clears throat> we get back from our honeymoon. I don't advise doing it this way, okay? Okay. We got married, went on our honeymoon, got back, and I was like, oh, I should probably go do labs to make sure I'm disease-free because I have a history. 
Don't play hard with me. Some of y'all have been in, the, in your car under the dome light of your car being like, Jesus, please let the result come back negative. <laughs> I know I'm not the only one in this room, but that was my prayer. But I waited. I should have done it before we even got married. But I waited, and then about 9 o'clock at night, my doctor calls me. How many of y'all know doctors don't call you at 9 at night? She's like, uh, Mr. Holter? And I was like, yeah. She's like, I need you to come to the emergency room right now. And I was like, uh, why? And she's like, well, there's a law called HIPAA. I can't tell you over the phone why. And I was like, oh, yes, you can. I want to know why you're calling me at 9 at night, telling me to come to the ER. What is it? She's like, I, I can't tell you. I'll lose my license. I'll lose my practice. And I was like, no, you need to tell me. I got it. Is it AIDS? Do I have cancer? Is it AIDS and cancer? Do I have the Ebola, Ecola? What is it? What do I have? <laughs> She's like, I can't tell you. I'm like, cough twice if it's AIDS. <laughs> like, just, <clears throat> just trying to negotiate with her. <laughs> She's like, just get here. And she goes, Luke, listen, final thing. Whatever you do, do not go to sleep. What? What does that mean? I got like nightmare on Elm Street disease? Like, I don't know. <laughs> right? You die in your dream, you die in real life. I don't know. I turned to my wife and I'm like, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I have to go to the hospital and die. Right? I'm crying and my, my new bride, my, my newlywed bride is sobbing. And she's like, you're going to die? And I was like, I am. I'm going to die. I've got to go to the hospital. They said, come there right now. And she's like, okay. Um, and I was like, don't come with me. I don't want you to see me die. I was just going <laughs> to. So I get to the hospital and my doctor is like, oh, thank goodness you're here. Okay. And I was like, okay, tell me now. Like I'm in the lobby. <laughs> There's people all around me, right? Other patients. And I'm like, tell me if I have AIDS. <clears throat> She's like can we talk in a room? And I'm like, no, like first. And she's like, you don't have AIDS. And I was like, let's go then. Okay. <clears throat> and I don't know what I would have done anyways, but I was like, you tell me right now. She's like, no, we got all your STD panels. You can't, you're clean. You're great. It's fine. You're, there's no issues. And I was like, thank you, Jesus. Wait, why am I here then? She's like, well, your blood sugar is 780. <clears throat> and I was like, okay. Is that good, or like, <laughs> you want to study my physique, or? <clears throat> She's like, no, normal is like 90 to 100. <clears throat> and I was like, oh, so what does that mean? She goes, well, Mr. Holter, you're a diabetic. A diabetic? That doesn't run in my family. Diabetes? Look, all I knew about diabetes was it was something really old people had. Like that, you know, because I'd see the commercials with Wilford Bramley. Diabetes, that guy, right? With the big mustache, diabetes, that guy. <laughs> Get your diabetes testing supplies, you know? And I was, like, I was like, well, I'm not an old man. Like, I shouldn't have diabetes. And they're like, yeah, you know, you got it. And they didn't give me any education. They just gave me um, insulin and seven oral medications. And they're like, take these, you know, and um, you can live a full, normal life if you're responsible. And I'm like, okay. They didn't tell me anything about low blood sugar. I didn't go to an education class. I go home. First of all, I get out of the hospital, and I don't call my bride, my newlywed. I'm the baby, so who do I call for? Mama. Mom. She's like, what's up, baby? Mom, I got to tell you something. I got bad news. I was just at the hospital. Baby, what is it? Mama, I got the sugars. I got the sugars, mama. How bad? Really bad, mom. I got it real bad. She's crying, baby, no. And I said, oh, mom. Diabetes, mom. <laughs> so I cried on my mom's phone for 20 minutes. Then I call my wife. And I'm like, listen, I have diabetes. If you want to annul the marriage, I understand. Because you probably didn't want to marry somebody with a disease. Like, totally acting. My wife, you know, all of her aunts and her mom are all nurses. They all work in hospitals. That's like how they came over to America, nursing visa. 
So they came over as nurses. And I said, listen, I understand if you want to annul the marriage and dead silence on the phone. I'm thinking, why isn't she weeping at the news? Dead silence on the phone. And then my wife bursts out laughing. And I was like, what is this? You're laughing? And she's like, you're an idiot. And I was like, what? How can you talk to me like that in my moment of need? I've got diabetes. <laughs> like, hey, I'm Filipino. Half my family's diabetic or a nurse. Like, we got you covered. Like, it's mannered. She's like, my dad has diabetes. He does? She's like, yes. Come home, dummy. And I'm like, okay. <clears throat> so I go home to my compassionate. <laughs> and I do something not to do. I went to Google. <laughs> My motives were pure, right? I went to Google this good tips for first diagnosed diabetics. What comes up? The first thing that comes up, you will die seven years early. And I'm like, I will? Like, that's just the tagline on the website. <laughs> seven years early? How long The next article reading Chop your legs off. I was like, that's part of the... Somebody's just going to show up at my... And be like, we heard you're diabetic. We're here for your feet. You got to take them. Like, I just... Leaving everything about this on the internet. I came into covenant with the spirit... Why do we fear? Because we lack control and we don't trust God. I couldn't control the situation anymore. I couldn't stop myself from having diabetes. I had it, and now I had to figure out a way to pray through it. But instead, I wanted to control it because I believed God let me down by allowing me to get it. So I started reading more. Then I went online and started reading the side effects of my medications. Y'all ever do that? Don't. Unless you have a reaction, don't do it. Like, I convinced myself I had every effect of every medication I was taking. The really exotic side If you were ever orbiting Mars and were exposed to gamma radiation, you might grow a tail feather. Like, I'm torturing my poor wife. I'm like, please look. Just look back there. I just, I feel something. I know I have it. Just please. She's like, it's your tailbone, dummy. It's not a tail feather. You're fine. When were you at Mars? When were you orbiting Mars? I convinced myself I had every side effect, and I quit taking my diabetes medication. I decided I'm going to go the natural homeopathic route. So I went to a natural medicine doctor. <laughs> And he gave me a bunch of cinnamon bark and chromium. And I passed out because I took too much chromium. <laughs> then I went back in and I started looking up the side effects of chromium, taking too much chromium, which can kill you. And so I went to the natural medicine doctor and he's like, yeah, honestly, there's not enough to control your sugar. Like, we don't have enough naturopathic medicine to, to really help you. And I was like, okay. He's like, if you get it lower, because remember, this time it's still in the... 500s. He's like, if you get it lower, then maybe we can. So I stopped taking all medications, and I was working at the time at Shell Oil, downtown Houston. My wife lost her job because Obama was in office, and he cut funding to NASA. So her and 80% of her coworkers lost their jobs. And so she's not working. I'm working. We're trying to get pregnant. Lord, help me. I'm working at Shell Oil. I get on the bus, the 246 bus to go downtown. I'm on that bus, and all of a sudden, I get clammy, sweaty. My heart starts racing, and a voice pops into my head and says, you're going to die. And I jump up on the bus, and I, for some reason, start yelling out at the top of my lungs, I'm going to die. <laughs> And everybody on the bus is starting to freak out because I'm jumping up, yelling, I'm going to die. And I get tackled by these two guys that hold me down on the ground. And the lady that drove our bus was this mean old angry black lady. And she did not play ever with anyone, ever. Her smile muscles were broke, I think. 
She just didn't have it. She was done with life. She just rented her body out to another spirit, I think, because she was she'd given up. <laughs> so she pulls over the 246 bus on the side of the highway and she goes, You ain't dying on my bus. She goes, I ain't got time for the paperwork. And they carried me off the bus and threw me on the side of the highway in Houston. So I call my wife and I'm like, I'm dying. And they threw me off the bus. And she's like, what? And I'm like, I'm dying. I, 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 please come get me. I'm dying. And she came. She dro- I didn't know that what I was having was called a panic attack. And so she came and got me and took me to the hospital. She's crying. I'm scaring her. We get to the ER and I come walking in there and I'm like, I'm going to die. I'm dying. And they're like, okay, lay down. And they hooked me up to a machine. And they're like, well, your blood pressure is a little elevated. Your heart rate's a little elevated. You're not going to die. You're having something that's called a panic attack. I was like, okay, well, uh, what do I do? And they're like, take this pill. They gave me a pill. And like 10 minutes later, I was like, oh my gosh. I'm looking at nurses walking by. I'm like, I love you. Thank you for fixing me. (laughs) They look at my wife. They're like, he's okay. You can take him home. So I went home with this prescription for anxiety medicine. Then I went on Google. One of the side effects was could, could alter your version of reality. And I was like, I got enough problems. Like, I don't need to think I'm a glass of orange juice. You know, like, don't, don't tip, don't tip me. Like, I got enough problems in life. So I flushed my anxiety medicine down the toilet. I started taking my diabetes medication again because it was out of control. I got hospitalized a few times. I'm traveling the world and preaching the gospel. I lose my job at Shell Oil. So I start traveling. As soon as I get fired, boom, my schedule just blew up without me promoting myself at all. So it was the Lord. I'm traveling, praying for the sick, watching people get healed. A lady got healed of stage four breast cancer in our meeting. And I'm mapping on my phone the closest emergency room so I can go there if I have a problem. I was worshiping fear. I didn't have faith. Now, my wife and I were told we couldn't have kids. So I got my wife pregnant. Now we're living on a ministry budget. She's not working. We're getting pink slipped on our house. We lose the first pregnancy. A few months into it, I'm preaching at a pulpit just like this one. And I get a phone call from my wife and I pick up because we have a rule. If my wife calls me while I'm preaching, I answer. And it's not because I disrespect the pulpit. It's because she's more important than all the churches I preach at combined. And if she's calling me, she knows I'm preaching. That means it's an emergency. So I picked it up. She said, come home, I'm bleeding. I drove home. By the time I got home, I walked into the bathroom and I saw it was too late. We had already lost a pregnancy. And I was angry. And it wasn't God that spoke to me first. It was the devil. Because the devil is an opportunist. He loves to look for the holes in your armor. My prayer for you today is that you would have enough faith to cover up any holes in your armor. In my core, I still had no holes in my armor at that point. The enemy came and said, if you worship me, I'll make you one of the most powerful psychics in the world, and you'll never lose another child. I mean, how powerful is your God? He can't keep a baby in your wife? Those are some of the things he started saying. And all I could do was grab a hold of the rope of faith and pull on that to pull myself out of that darkness. And I just cried out the name of Jesus. And I mean, I whimpered it out. Jesus, just like that, the devil was gone. He had showed up with all this power. And then as soon as I whimpered out the name Jesus, he was petrified, petrified at the name of Jesus. So a month later after miscarrying, my wife gets pregnant. And this time it stuck. But she's still not working. We're not making, there was churches that just never paid us. Some of you may not know how ministry works. I don't go and say, everybody's got to pay me this certain amount or I'm not coming. Like, but some churches don't pay. They say it's in the mail and they never send it. So we don't get to pay bills. Or we need to go to the government and get help. 
People don't see that side a lot, but it happens. And so we're getting pink slipped on our house, getting ready to lose our house. We now have a newborn. My wife's crying, holding our baby that's crying. We're negative $2,000 in our bank account. Both of our cars broke down. The transmission went out on both of them. Can I tell you I had reasons to be afraid? I had reasons to fear. I'm sitting there looking in the mirror in my bathroom, crying out to God, going, why have you done this to me? See, when money got tight, you know what I did? I did what a lot of Christians do. I stopped tithing. I entered into a curse. I stopped giving, period. Even if you're of the school where you're like, I don't believe in tithing, whatever. I stopped giving at all to God which is not a good thing to do. I entered into a curse. But I'm crying out in the mirror going, why why have you forsaken me and my family? I'm one of your boys. We're leading thousands to Christ and, and you can't pay our bills. And I hear the Holy Spirit audibly in my bathroom and this is what he says. Give up. No. Luke, surrender. I will not surrender. You let me get sick. Surrender. You let my baby die. Surrender. I'm going to lose my house. Surrender. And it hit me. I couldn't make myself live longer. That's up to him. I can just be responsible with my health. I couldn't stop my wife from losing the first pregnancy. It was out of my control. But I could take care of the baby I have now. I couldn't fix my two cars that broke down. I couldn't fix our money situation. And I realized the whole time I was so controlling due to fear that I stopped my blessing. And the Lord said, repent. And the moment I repented... My phone goes off with an email notification that says somebody just donated $10,000 to your ministry. Now I'm crying and I go to my wife and I'm like, somebody gave us money. (laughs) Like we're crying and we're like, we're saved. And like we were able to get our bank account back to zero. We needed two grand just to get back to zero. So we were able to do that. We were able to get out of foreclosure but we still had two cars that needed to be fixed. The truth is, the problem is that I wasn't thankful. You want to increase your faith? Practice thankfulness. I should have been happy that I had a wife that I could even have a baby with. I should have been happy I had two cars I could lose. I should have been happy I had a house to lose in the first place. I grew up in poverty in trailer parks. I didn't have shoes till first grade. I know poverty. I know what it's like to get the government cheese, and that's how I was raised. My dad didn't make anything being a pastor. The church came by once a month with groceries. And that wound still was in my heart at that time. I had to let all that go and go through some deliverance and get it out to grab a hold of faith again. The Lord said, I didn't give this money to you because you cried. He said, I actually had this money for you six months ago but you wouldn't get out of your own way. You delayed your own breakthrough. Can I tell you, we immediately tithed. We took those cars. I took them to a mechanic and I said, hey, I just went to a random shop and I said, if you fix this car, I'll give you this free and you can just afford to fix them both. To fix them both, it was $500. I was like, I can't afford that. And he looks at me and he goes, can I take you to lunch? And I was like, I don't know. Right? Because <laughs> you know where people are coming from yet. And I'm like, sure. Maybe? He's like, there's a really great fajita place down there. Okay. So I go with him and his father to lunch. And he goes, you don't know me. You don't know my dad. You know my brother. 
like, I know your brother. He's like, yeah, you volunteered rehab center for a number of years where my brother was a meth addict. You counseled him and helped him get, and he returned to his family. I have three kids and he's successful and still sober all these years later, contributing to society. He goes, I got my brother back and my father got back. And he goes, and we just want you to know, as long as you're free, we will fix all your vehicles for free. <laughs> I had faith. I could have been out of pain. Matthew 6, 25 says this, do not be anxious. That's how it starts. 25, it says, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. Eat or what you will drink, nor about your body. What you will put on is not life more than food. And the birds of the air, they neither sow nor barns. And yet, heavenly father feeds them. Are you not of than they? And first, faith is under attack because you have low self. You don't believe that you're as valuable as God said you are. I'm going to give you a little nugget of spirit. Low self-esteem is an assault on the cross. At Calvary and saying, you got it wrong. I wasn't valuable enough to die for. I disagree with your assessment on my value, Jesus. With low self-esteem, eventually it will be an atheistic heart posture. You won't believe God. Being anxious can add an hour to his span of life. And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. They, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? We'll stop there. Will he not you, oh, you of little faith? If you're struggling with bills, if you're struggling with fear about how you're going to make it, trade fear for thankfulness. Maybe you got your situation you're in. Maybe you went to a place or a title loan place and now you're upside down on something. I've done that in the past. Fear and making bad business decisions, getting a high interest rate credit, all those kind of things. God delivered us out of poverty, and he delivered us out of debt. And it's not that I'm a multimillionaire, but I'm fed, if you can't tell. I'm built like a Hot Pocket. That's why I have a beard. It's because I'm shaped like a thumb. My wife's like, don't ever shave your beard. It's good advice. Listen to your husbands. Listen to your wives, okay, about your look. Just trust me. You don't want to look like a weird old dad. So I came to you as a physician today, and I'm going to give you a prescription. And here's the great news. There's no negative side effects. You don't even have to Google it. Here's your prescription. Pay attention, because this is how you're going to get through anxiety, fear, worry. Look, I had COVID twice. Immediately went to my lungs. Immediately got, got uh, pneumonia. Immediately. The first time I got it was in February of 2020. Then I got it this last uh, New Year's Eve. And I was told by the medical community, you have diabetes, you're a strong uh, candidate for death from COVID. That's what I was told. And I had a choice, because I had to quarantine for 15 days the first time. And I was COVID positive for 28 days at that time. And I laid in bed with breathing equipment on my face because of pneumonia in my lungs, dropping oxygen levels. And I had a choice to enter a covenant with fear or to believe God and trust God, li living or dying. I had to have faith. If I died, he's just. And he's still good. But I had to believe that I would live. And doctors told me there was nothing they could do. This was in February of 2020. And then one of my pastor friends said, go to this clinic in Chinatown in Houston. I was like, all right. It is a ghetto clinic 
in a strip mall. Right next to it, they sell hair extensions and rims <laughs> in the same shop. <laughs> right? Like you can go rent some rims and get your hair did. Okay? Just saying. It's in that strip mall. Now, I walk in. The lady's name is Dr. Stella Emanuel. She's from Nigeria. She was all over the news. She led a petition at the White House about using hydrochloroquine. So I went in, and all these <laughs> Nigerian and Hispanic nurses were like, can we help you? And I was like, I have an appointment. I'm COVID positive. And they're like, okay. And what's your name? I said, Luke Holter. And they stopped, and they're like, are you the prophet that they told us about? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, sit down in the lobby. And I'm sitting down there playing worship music in the lobby. These nurses come over immediately. These Nigerian and Hispanic nurses immediately come over, and they're like, like they're going in. And there's other people in there that are not believers that are like, there's a lady with her hijab on looking over there. And they're like, speaking in tongues over me. And I'm like, <laughs> crying like, I receive it. I went into the office. Dr. Stella Emanuel was like, they told you there's no hope, right? I was like, yeah. They told me to make a will. That's what the emergency room told me. They said, go home and make a will. She gave me a shot in the butt. She's like, drop your drawers, man of God. And I was like, I, I don't know if I should. I, mean, I used to live a certain way, and I just <laughs> gave me a shot of some antibiotic of some kind. I didn't ask. She put me on a breathing treatment and gave me hydrochloroquine. I went home and was on hydrochloroquine for 48 hours, and all the pneumonia was gone. All of it. Now, I'm not advocating. Look, people get weird about stuff, all right? There's a lot of politicizing about the virus. I'm not interested in any of it, okay? I'm not a political prophet. I have to stay. I don't say neutral as in approving of things that are not good, but I try to stay out of politics so I can prophesy purely. Because there are people that I prophesy over that are in political positions on both sides of the aisle. And that's why they listen to me is because I don't pick a side. I vote my belief system at the booth but I don't make it publicly known what I believe. Um, that's up to y'all. So I go home after two days, boom, healthy. Pneumonia's gone. I get up, I start walking around. I'm good. I'm healthy. Then this last New Year's, I got it. And it was worse than the first time. And I was like, what do I do? You know, like, I don't know what to do. Followed the same regimen. Didn't work. I was like, what do I do? They're like, you need monoclonal antibodies. And now I'm fearful because Joe Biden had just put a rule in. Now, this rule for the monoclonal antibodies, I don't know how it's working in Chicago, but in Houston, this is how it worked. It changed the rule for hospitals where they could be penalized if they gave somebody that's considered white, middle class, the medication. So I went to the hospital, the Methodist, and they said, you can't have it. And I said, why? They said, you don't meet the economic or the racial profile that we've just been handed down. And I was like, uh, they said, you don't qualify. I said, I'm a type 1 diabetic with COVID pneumonia. How do I not qualify? I said, I'm not a millionaire. I'm middle class. And they're like, if you go to Pasadena, which they call Little Mexico in Houston, they're like, if you go to Pasadena, go to a clinic there, they have it there, they'll give it to you. So I went over there to Little Mexico, and I was like, hola. <laughs> like, would you like some uh, monoclonal antibodies? And I was like, Simon. <laughs> they said, you don't qualify. You're right. <laughs> I was like, uh-oh. So I called one of my friends that's a state legislator. And I said, this is my situation. He said, do you have faith? And I said, yeah. He goes, I don't have an answer for you yet. Have faith. I believe, this is a Baptist dude. He's like, I believe God's going to deliver you today into the hands of a monoclonal antibody. I said, okay. I get an untraceable email. How do I know it's untraceable? Because my wife works for NASA. And that's what she does. She writes code and creates software for satellites and all sorts of stuff. We couldn't trace this, but it had a location on it. It said, go to this location at this time. 
do not share any, this address with anyone. So I drive an hour and a half from my house to the woodlands to an abandoned warehouse that's for sale. And it's got big wrought iron gates that all of a sudden start opening. And I pull in and there's like five guys in hazmat suits. And I'm like, okay. The grass is long. It's tall. You know, like nobody's been there. The gate closes. They search me for cameras and I'm not allowed to bring my phone in. So I walk into this abandoned warehouse that has a small medical lab set up in it. There's nurses and two doctors working and they've got lawn chairs from Walmart laid out with broom handles with monoclonal antibodies hanging from them. And I was like, what in the world did I just walk into? They're like, these are monoclonal antibodies. This is totally under the radar. But somebody contacted us and said that your life was dependent on this. And I got the monoclonal antibodies. The next day, all of my pneumonia was gone. And it was worse the second time. Right? God provided a way. Even when, even when there was policies in place to prevent it, God provided a way. Don't worry about what you see with your natural eyes. God has a plan. No matter how impossible, listen, David fought Goliath. That was impossible. He's a little shepherd boy. Everybody in the Israelite army worshipped the size of Goliath. They said, do you see how big he is? How giant he is? David refused to worship the size of Goliath. He went and killed him, slayed him because he knew that he could. This is your prescription. Philippians 4, 6. This is your answer to worry. Philippians 4, 6 says in verse 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard, you, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So what are the two areas that are under attack when you have fear, anxiety, and worry? Your heart and your mind. You feel crazy things and you think crazy things. Any of y'all ever do something crazy out of fear, worry, and anxiety, and you're like, that was a bad choice? Yeah, most of us in the room. <laughs> most of us in the room have made some choice that we're like, that was not good. <clears throat> so Philippians 4, 6 is your prescription. Now, how many of you know it's important to know what words mean in the Bible? Right? It's not enough to just surfacely read it. Sometimes that's great, just pleasure reading, whatever. If you really want to be a good steward of the Word of God, get into word studies. Just start picking out words. In the day and age of technology, you have no reason to be ignorant on the things of God. My phone has an entire theological seminary in it. It's not, it's not I, I have an app. I'm going to help some of y'all out. I'm going to help some of y'all out. It's not too complicated. I have an app called Olive Tree. Okay, download the app Olive Tree. You can download the ESV version Bible with the Strong's Concordance right in it. People are like, wow, Dr. Luke, yeah, I do have a PhD in biblical theology. But here's the deal. The, the reason I sound smart with stuff in the Greek and Hebrew is because I push one stupid button. Right? You ready? And it pops up right there. Tells me what it means, the context, the culture, all of it right there. You got no reason to be ignorant on the Bible in the day and age we live in with technology. We can learn all the ins and outs of TikToks and do the dance and shake the booty and record all the stuff. But we can't do a word study. It's food for thought. Some of y'all, some of y'all bought cameras for your home, right? With the rim lights and all that, so you can do your thing. But you can't read the Bible. I don't understand it. Right. This is what it says. It says, through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. I'm gonna break those three down because those are the components. We're gonna if I could have and play keys, that would be preferably something in a minor chord so people cry. Thank you so much. <laughs> you know what's funny to me is, is uh, have you guys heard about this thing called deconstruction? It's all over TikTok. It's basically people that were butt hurt in church that are coming out now and they're like, redo church and the woundedness and a bunch of talking about the ways they were hurt. Okay, that's deconstructing church. Uh, but there are differences between Bible culture and church culture. Amen? We want Bible culture. Right? We don't need Christian superstition. 
Amen? All right. I'm going to give you the components here. It says, through prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. So prayer, in the Greek, means worship. It doesn't mean to pray. It means worship. So when fear, anxiety, and worry hit your life, the first thing you should do is put on some worship music. The first, don't, don't sit there and dwell on the problem. Don't sit there and go into an imagination that will rob you of joy, that will rob you of your peace. God gave you that peace as a birthright for your life. Instead of being shook, put on some worship music. Let that wash over you. Let that start. Even, listen, even Saul, who was demonized, loved worship because it soothed his demons. How much greater is it for us who are not demonized, but believe and are filled with the Spirit. Put, refuse to worship the problem and instead put on worship music. That's the first thing I do. I got a phone call a few weeks back. One of my childhood best friends OD'd and died. Now I had an option to spiral into depression about my friend that I tried over the years to reach. But instead, I put on some worship music. And I started singing, how great is our God. I started singing all these beautiful worship songs. And it pulled me out of the temptation to hurt in a way that's unhealthy. Yes, I could mourn my friend, and I did. But when something hits your life, you lose your job, you lost some money, she left you, he left you, maybe you lost something, whatever your situation, do not entertain the pain. Put on some worship music and allow the Holy Spirit to pull you out of that thinking. Allow him to pull you out of the trauma. Some of you don't have to step into that trauma and own it. Some of you can just get delivered from it instantly or not even let it get rooted in the first place by playing some worship music and giving it to the Father. There is right now a generation that's known for bragging about its trauma. We don't, we don't brag about trauma. Everybody in the world has trauma. Just because you may be the first person to experience it in your family doesn't mean that it's not everywhere. So here's your prescription. The first one is worship. Put on some worship music. The second word is supplication. It says with prayer and supplication. Supplication, it's like, what does that mean? We just gloss over words and go, okay, supplication. Supplication means petitioning prayer. It means a desperate assassin-like focus on the subject or the object that you're praying about, the thing that you're praying through. You get specific. You're not sitting like, if you got a diagnosis of leukemia in a kid, you don't go home to your kitchen table and go, well, in the name of Jesus, I pray for my neighbor's dog. May the neighbor's dog be blessed. Lord, the restaurant we ate at last week, I pray that all the staff would be blessed. No, you're at that table saying, my son, Tony, will not die from leukemia. You are naming the exact thing and you are focused on it. You're interceding, you're fasting and praying and not relenting. That's supplication. So first you get your worship on. Second, you go to war. You start naming some things. You know, the enemy is always accusing you naming things. Why don't you name what you want breakthrough in? The third, and what I believe is the most powerful component to breaking fear, anxiety, and worry off your life is thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is key for breaking off worry. A thankful heart will break off entitlement. Listen, the enemy of thankfulness is entitlement. Entitlement says, I believe I'm owed something. It's a form of control. It's saying, I'm being withheld from. I believe I'm owed something. Entitlement will always kill thankfulness, and it will always kill God's generosity. If you believe you're owed something and you don't humble yourself in thankfulness, You will experience poverty. Entitlement is related to poverty. Thankfulness is related to the spirit of wealth, which is not just money. It's not just finances. It's peace, wholeness, joy, health. The whole sozo, the whole thing together. Like I said, I should have been happy that I had a home to lose. I should have been happy I had two cars that could break down. I should have been happy I had a wife that I could go through these things with. I'm going to come down here. I needed a spirit of thanksgiving. And it's easy to lose thanksgiving when you're in survival mode. Can I just tell you all that? How many of you would like to be done surviving and just step into thriving? Because you were meant to be more than a conqueror. Do you know what that means? It means that you don't just survive. 
It means you don't just win the battle, but you get the spoils of war. Whenever Israel went to battle with a pagan army, they took their gold, silver, livestock, all the things the enemy had, they took back. They, the temple that was built to house God's presence was forged out of pagan gold, won in battles where they were victorious. You were called to be more than a conqueror. I want you all to close your eyes. <clears throat> Thank you, Holy Spirit. Just keep your eyes closed. I'm going to pray for you this morning. If you're in here this morning and you're saying, you know what? I've been going through a trial. I've been going through a test. I'm wrestling with these feelings of frustration or <clears throat> maybe where your faith is being attacked. Maybe you lost your job because of COVID. Maybe you lost your house because of COVID. Whatever situation you find yourself in, God wants to increase your faith. Some of you are waiting on housing and it's been crazy. But the Lord will increase your faith and you will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. With every head bowed and eye closed, if you're in here this morning, and you want to break your agreement with worry? You want to break your agreement with fear? Just lift one hand to the Lord. Yeah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Yeah. You can all put your hands down. We're going to pray this together as a community. Every head bowed and eye closed. We're going to pray this as a community. I just want you to repeat after me. Jesus, I break my agreement with worry. I break my agreement with anxiety Father heal my heart and my mind Jesus I receive your peace that passes all understanding I make a new agreement in the name of Jesus with peace my future is bright I have the hope of Jesus Christ in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God's good. A lot of hands went up across this room needing breakthrough the enemy's job is to come back he's the boomerang he's always looking for doors to walk through next time he comes knocking with fear tell him you don't live there anymore tell him he's got the wrong address send him down the block to the Mormons <laughs> I'm joking close your eyes we're going to wait on the Holy Spirit we're going to see if there's anything else going around up in there my job is not to prophesy over you. My job is to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. The truth is you have a father that wants to speak to you himself. My prayer is that you will hold still long enough to hear him. Thank you, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> this young man back here with the white shirt on, Right here, that just looked up. Would you come up here? I want you just to come stand right here facing me. What's your first name? Joshua. Joshua. Nice to meet you, Joshua. Everyone extend your hands towards Joshua. You just stay here facing me, Joshua. I'm going to pray for you, Joshua. Um, when I was just looking around the room, typically how the Holy Spirit works is he shows me pictures, just random pictures in my brain. And so I saw a banner that was floating over your head. What was interesting is your head wasn't your head. It was a computer. And I felt really strong like the Lord was saying that he's given you a high level of intelligence and understanding and to think outside the box and to think differently. But I saw this phrase over your head of businessman. That's what the Lord said, that he's always put it in you to have an entrepreneurial gift on your life. Um, it's really interesting, but you know, the enemy had wanted to use your gift set for the world. But the Lord found you and said, I picked you. I gave you the way you think. I gave you this spirit of excellence that's in your heart.
The Lord says, and I'm going to release an entrepreneurial spirit over you um, that will show others that God has money and provision and that God will provide. You are actually a sign to your family about the goodness of God. This is what the Lord said. He said, you are going to be a sign to your family that God provides. So Father, I thank you for my brother. Lord, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, um, for his mind. God, that he thinks differently. God, that he, uh, you know, fathers tell their sons that they're proud of them, that their lives matter, that they're successful. And I just want to speak over you as a father right now and just tell you, you are successful. And I just want to tell you as a father, I am so proud of the potential that's in you and all the amazing things that you'll get to do for God. If you dare to believe and step out of your comfort zone, the Lord says, I'll take you places that nobody could ever hustle their way to. The Lord says, I'm going to take you into rooms that nobody could bribe their way in. The Lord said, I've got things for you using your intelligence and the way that you think to bless your life. Lord, I thank you for the breakthrough that's coming. Lord, we release an entrepreneurial blessing, favor on his finances, Father, just like everywhere Joseph went, God, Joseph was favored. Lord, I pray that everywhere he goes, everything he touches would be blessed and favored. That people would want to be around him simply because he brings favor with him. Lord, I pray that you would walk out the fullness of his calling. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Does that make sense? You know, something the last uh, year really that God's been doing is releasing um, businesses in the body of Christ, releasing people into business, starting their own businesses, starting to take risks on what God's shown them financially. Um, so if you're in here and you are a business owner or you would like to be a business owner, you believe that God's got something for you in that avenue, just stand up right where you're at. If you currently own a business or if you want to own a business, stand up. The Lord shared with me a long time ago that money in the hands of a believer is a sword against injustice. And so we're going to pray for all of you that are standing up. Everybody that's seated, just extend a hand towards those that you see standing up. We're going to agree because when they're blessed, our community is blessed. So those of you that are standing, just hold your hands out like this. Yep, just like this. And close your eyes. I pray right now in the name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would step into new levels of business. We release funding in the name of Jesus. We release friends to come alongside you to sow into what you're doing. I want to declare over you that your dream is not foolish. It is not a waste. But God is interested in filling your hand with provision. Father, give them the right relationships. Give them a spirit of wisdom and revelation. May they be as wise as a serpent and as gentle as a dove. Father, guard them to break off those that would be around them to uh, take advantage of them. Lord, bring the right relationships into their lives. Hmm. Lord, release finances and breakthrough. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, except for this guy right here. Come up here, please. Come stand right here facing me. What's your first name? Kator. Kator? Yeah. All right. Everybody extend your hands towards Kator. While we were praying, you know, the Lord was highlighting you just then when we were praying, and he was kind of showing me some interesting pictures. The Lord's taking you through a season where you've had people that were posing as fathers that were actually brothers brothers compete and fathers celebrate and the Lord said I'm bringing fathers into your life now that are going to help you maintain the vision that God's put in you brothers compete out of jealousy and there's those that have actually said that they're fathers but really they're looking for what they can get <clears throat> this is what the Lord said just like I prayed for him about Joseph the Lord said you were also like Joseph this is interesting you're a dreamer and it's intimidated people this is what the Lord said and you had brothers that were supposed to walk with you but instead they sold you off relationally, just like Joseph was sold off. 
so they walked away from you and sold you off because they were intimidated by the dreamer. But the Lord made you to dream. He didn't make you to keep your feet on the ground. <laughs> this is what the Lord said. Joseph was sold off into slavery. But everywhere Joseph went, he was elevated. And this is what the Lord said. You'll be elevated just like Joseph. And even those that sold you out will come to you again one day for a drink and you will not deny them because you will not be bitter from it. You will be better from it. The Lord said, I called you to truly step into fatherhood. And the Lord says, as I bless you, you're going to become a mentor. Even greater than what you've experienced now, the Lord says, you're going to become a mentor. So Lord, I just thank you, Father. Um, that's interesting. The Lord said, it's not a pipe dream. Lord, but there's provision attached. It's like this prayer. I saw your head on your pillow. God, if they could just see what I see, if they could just see it the way I see it, Lord, they would buy into it. They would believe it. If they could just see how I see, and that's been the wound for you, is trying to get others to see things rightly. And the Lord said, I've given you prophetic vision to see. Hmm. So Lord, I thank you that the Lord says they're coming. The fathers are coming. The fathers are coming and on their backs are provision. So Lord, I thank you for the fathers that are coming that will celebrate him. Hmm. Hmm. You know, I even saw these ways when you were younger where you were mishandled. Yeah. Mishandled by people claiming Christianity. Mishandled by people that were claiming to be people of great faith. But the Lord just says, listen, you're going to help repair broken down places. In church culture, where people failed you, you're going to be able to step in and repair those places. So Lord, I thank you for all the provision that's coming. The Lord says, this is the one thing I want you to remember when you get to where you're going, the Lord said. Son, don't forget who brought you to the dance. Amen. This is what he said. He said, don't forget who brought you to the dance. And remember to always reach down to pull up. So Lord, I thank you, God, that he will truly be a father economically and also through discipleship. Lord, I pray he would walk out the fullness of his calling. In your name we pray. Amen. Make sense? Thank you. Yeah. Well. All right. Close your eyes. Tell Jesus you love him. We'll see if there's anything else kicking around up there for you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. That's interesting. Uh, this woman over here that's next to the guy in the white shirt, would you come up here, please? Yeah. Come stand right here facing me. Wait, hold on. Not you, I'm sorry. Step to the right here. Uh, my right. You. Yes. Yeah, no, no, you can stay. There's two things going on <laughs> at once. Just wait right there. Come up here first. What's your first name? Shannon. Shanna? Shannon. Shannon. Nice to meet you, Shannon. <laughs> um, just close your eyes. Just extend your hands to, up here towards her. <clears throat> Thank you, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Thank you, Holy Spirit. Shannon, what the Lord said is that you've been in a season that's felt like a slingshot. Felt like you were even going backwards. And you were looking at it going, I'm, I feel like I'm losing ground. I feel like I'm losing ground. And the Lord said, you're in the season of the slingshot. What has been disheartening is that there's been areas where you feel like there's lost ground. But the Lord says, honey, hang on, because I'm getting ready to release you. He said, I'm getting ready to release the slingshot. And there will be an acceleration in your forward movement. It feels like it's that thing of like, you know, two steps forward, one step back and all those things. And the Lord says, no, we're just going to start clearing ground now. And so, Lord, I thank you. Um, what a good thing that you serve a forgetful God, that he can forget the past. The Lord says, my desire to bless you is not based on your ability to keep a promise, but it's based on my goodness as a father. Um, thank you, Holy Spirit. You know, fathers were supposed to tell their daughters that they're beautiful and that they're worthy, that they're intelligent. And I'm going to speak over you as a father and tell you, you are beautiful, you are worthy, and you are intelligent. 
and the Lord says, honey, where we're going, I, I saw you getting on a plane with Jesus and you had all this luggage, right? And he's like, sorry, babe, we're going to have to leave it at the airport. He said, get on. And all this luggage was things from the past. It was things that you held against yourself. And the Lord said, baby, I don't see any of that stuff. So Lord, I just thank you for your new daughter, Lord, um, for the newness of her heart, for the newness of her incredible faith, Lord. Um, God, I thank you that there's only good things ahead. God, that you will provide for her, that you will make a way. He said, watch the miracles I perform in your family. Watch what I do. Watch that I don't knock on the door of every family member you love and show myself to them. The Lord says, that's the kind of prayer life you have. He said that I'm inspired to go to everybody you love and show them myself. Interesting. I saw you sitting at a kitchen table praying and interceding with names on a list. And the Lord said, every name I heard. He said, not one of those arrows has missed heaven. He said, I kept track of every name. The Lord said, and I'm even going to come in and repair bridges of understanding between you and family. The Lord said, places where the enemy had destroyed communication, where he had destroyed um, through reputation or through misunderstandings. The Lord says, I'm coming in and I'm repairing every bridge for you and for them. The Lord says, I'm going to give you the gift of opening their eyes. So Lord, I thank you for what's ahead, that there's restoration and beauty ahead. God, that you're giving her double honor for shame, beauty for ashes, Father. Lord, all the tears she sowed in prayer, you're getting ready to bring a harvest. Lord, I thank you for all the good that's ahead of her. I pray she'd walk out the fullness of her calling. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Make sense? Next. Come stand right here facing me. What's your first name? Delilah. Can I shake your hand, Delilah? Nice to meet you, Delilah. Everybody extend your hands towards Delilah. <laughs> Delilah, um, as soon as you started walking up here, that's why I said stay. The Lord showed me a picture instantly when I saw you walking up. Um, I saw a tube of lipstick, okay? And uh, here, put your hands out just like this. I'm just going to pray for you. Um, I saw you like a tube of lipstick. You were two things. The Lord twisted the tube of lipstick and all this beautiful red came out. And the Lord said, this is what I want to do with you. I want you to come out of your shell. The Lord said, people need to see the beautiful red in you. People need to see the beautiful colors in you of who you are. Um, this is really interesting. Um, the other thing was the 4th of July. I know we just celebrated the 4th of July, but you were like fireworks. And the Lord says, there's so much beauty in you that I want people to experience the Lord says, you're not broken. You're not a project. You're a daughter. This is what he said. He goes, I see so much value in you. And you have this softness to you. There's a natural kindness in you. And it's almost like I saw you getting around people and all the stress and pressure they felt melted away. The Lord says, I've given you a deliverance ministry on your life. Just to be around people and feel freedom come. But the Lord says, it's time this year to let people experience you. Live out loud. Let them see all the beauty that's in you. Don't be bashful. Come out of your shell and be an explosion of personality. Lord, I just pray that she would walk out the fullness of her calling, Father. God, that she would not shrink back um, out of bashfulness, Lord, but that she would spring forth. God, that people would get to experience the beauty of her. I pray she would walk out the fullness of your calling, Lord. Lord, I even pray, it's like I saw this picture of you looking in a mirror. And you had tweezers and you were kind of picking at yourself. And the Lord said, this year we're removing that. He said, you're not going to pick yourself apart. You're going to see the woman in the mirror that he sees. You're going to see the person in the mirror that he sees who is valuable, gifted. People are blessed to know you and to call you friend. Lord, I thank you that you said she's a good friend. I pray she'd walk out the fullness of her calling. In your name we pray. Amen. Make sense? <laughs> Well, well, amen. Isn't God good? You know, you can do what I do. People think, I can't hear God like that. Yes, you can. It's just about you taking a risk. You have a father that wants to talk to you himself, that wants to tell you things. I encourage you to do what Samuel did, and that's 
When you're at home, get your smartphone out or get a notepad and a pen, whatever you want to do it the OG way or the new way, new school or old school, however you want to do it, ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you and hold still long enough to hear Him. People have got to start working out this muscle in the church. Amen? I'm one person, you're many. God's trying to do an organic grassroots movement in the church where people will listen, believe, and be obedient. Have you ever prayed and felt like you heard God answer your prayer? Just for yourself. Then you've prophesied. Now you just need to do it over somebody else. Pray for someone else and see what God says. Amen? Pastor, this is your microphone. Thank Prophet Dr. Luke Coulter for being here and being a friend of the ministry of Dunamis Life Church. And for most of you, it's the first time you ever got to meet him, but he has invested in this house. He's invested in my life ministry that we have here is because of his investment into us throughout the years and, and so we, we thank the Lord it's been a few years that he hasn't been in Chicago and um, we're going to make sure that that doesn't happen again as we were transitioning and moving forward what God was doing here in this house um, we have prepared and you guys who don't know, you know, when we talk about giving and tithing, we as a church, we tithe. And so if you don't know, part of our tithing goes into the ministry of Dr. Luke Holter. And, and so we we give into that ministry, and you guys are a part of that, uh, Columbia, and all the things that he does is because this ministry has been uh, giving to his ministry so that he can go out and do what God has called him to do. So know that we tithe as a church and, and this, this is one of the ministries that we tithe into and support on a monthly basis. And, and so we thank you that have been faithful in your giving and you want to help continue to support and um, cover, help with what it takes to bring uh, caliber of a person like this on your way out you can give um, with the ushers or you can give online and, and we would greatly appreciate that as well how many of you guys enjoyed the prophet dr how many want to bring him back again soon amen how many of you are going to buy his plane ticket <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. So we thank you guys. We appreciate you. Those of you who got baptized last week, if you got baptized, just um, wave, wave your hand in Lake Michigan and look at all these hands. If you came to church last Sunday and the doors were locked and you thought the rapture happened and you repented, no, we're still here. We're still here. But um, we thank the Lord for all you that got baptized. It was powerful at the beach to have service. We took Holy Communion on the beach. And then we had people out in the lake just watching us, kids, adults, clapping with us as we were baptizing people. It was so powerful, so great to see that. So we appreciate you. We honor you for um, getting baptized. We love you. And so today, we just pray that God will bless you, keep you safe. May the Lord keep you healthy and safe throughout this week. Don't forget, Friday, we have um, Spanish Bible, I mean, Spanish service here at 7.30. We have the tribe at 7.30. Uh, we're continuing on teaching on deliverance ministry. And then we also have um, Outbreak Youth. So we have something for everybody on Friday night. Don't forget your Bible studies throughout the week on Facebook and YouTube and Zoom. So we love you guys. May the Lord bless you, keep you safe. You are dismissed. God bless you.